This Christmas, it will be five years since the start of the war between the Afghan resistance, the Mujahideen, and the Russian army in Afghanistan. After an interval of two years, I recently made my second visit to the country to see what effect the war is having and to discover who, if anyone, is winning. With an ITN cameraman, Paul Carlton, and a sound recordist, John Hunt, I spent a month with the Mujahideen in an area where the Russians are trying to cut off the flow of men and weapons from across the Pakistani border. But that border is 1,500 miles long, the mountain trails are myriad, and the flow of men and arms is heavier and better organized than two years ago. We traveled through a virtually deserted landscape. The people who lived here are now nearly all refugees in Pakistan. Every so often, we'd stop at a tea house to rest and drink cups of sweet green tea. A great reviver on this march, which took us over 9,000 foot passes in blazing sunshine. I became a green tea addict. <laughs> the Mujahideen are tireless, but Westerners like myself find it hard to resist asking repeatedly and plaintively how much further there is to go. Do we have a long way to go today? Do we have much further to go today? Nearly there. These Mujahideen, most in their teens or early 20s, have left their families in Pakistan to come back and fight the jihad, the holy war against the infidel. For them, the jihad is an obligation, unpaid, but also an honor, a chance for glory. Everybody is caught up in it, even the children. Compared to two years ago, I found the Mujahideen much better armed. Some groups even have anti-aircraft missiles, like these SAMs, although it's doubtful if the international symbols this way up, fragile and keep dry, mean much to the Afghans, especially when everything has to be brought in over the mountains by pack horse. The logistical difficulties, especially for the groups in the deep interior, are horrendous. It may take a month or more to get in a fresh supply of desperately needed ammunition. This, more than anything, hampers the resistance and slows down their war effort. Each of these boxes contains two SAM-7s, a Russian missile, although the Chinese also make them. Each missile is said to cost a quarter of a million dollars. So this horse is carrying one million dollars worth of weaponry on its back. Our camera equipment, equally delicate but less expensive, had to be carried in the same way. From the border, we headed north and east towards the Kabul River, where our group planned to ambush a Russian convoy. Then back in a circle to Hisarak to try and capture a government fort, a journey of three to four hundred miles. Recently, the Russians have tried hard to block the guerrillas' infiltration routes in this key area, both along the border and also deeper in. 
The guerrillas' response has been to attack Russian convoys and outposts and blow up the power lines to Kabul. Two years ago, practically all these villages were inhabited. Today, they're deserted. It's estimated that 95% of the population of these border provinces has fled. Nangahar was once one of the most heavily populated parts of Afghanistan, the Pathan or Pashtu heartland. Often the only occupants are the Mujahideen themselves. The villages are their staging posts, their field kitchens, where they butcher and prepare the tough meat, mainly goat, on which their army marches. On the wall behind, a Chinese poster shows a Russian being chased out of Afghanistan by President Reagan. Traditionally in an Afghan village, the women always did the cooking. Now, with no women about, the Mujahideen have had to learn to do their own. Some of them are very young, mere boys like 12-year-old Rais Khan, youngest of 13 brothers, all Mujahideen. How long has he been fighting? And uh, does he like being a Mujahid? Would he not rather be at school? Would he not rather be at school? No. Has he ever been involved in any fighting? Oh. Oh. Where and when? Qatar. Qatar. A Mujahid's day, even on the march, is punctuated by prayers, beginning before dawn and ending late at night. Their Islamic faith burns as brightly as it ever did and appears indestructible. Most Westerners fall far short of Afghan standards of godliness, preferring cleanliness instead, although it's an almost unattainable ideal in Afghanistan. Even in the villages, baths don't exist, and the traveller's only hope is a convenient stream. And in order not to offend against local standards of decency, you're required to keep your underpants on throughout. But with no women about to give offence to, we were able to expose more of ourselves than would have been possible two years ago. We managed to have three open-air baths in four weeks marching, which is bordering on luxury for Afghanistan. In the last five years, the flood of Afghans leaving the country to escape the Russians has created the biggest refugee problem in the world. Three million in Pakistan, another million in Iran, four million in all, one quarter of the population, plus another half million internal refugees, people who fled their homes but are still in Afghanistan. 
Stavimo tu, stavimo, stavimo. When this little girl's donkey refused to budge, the Mujahideen were quick to help. We met this party of refugees three days in from the border. The temperature was in the 90s and there was no shade for miles. Among them were four young women we weren't allowed to film, but they told one of our escorts they'd all been raped by Russian soldiers, all were pregnant, and one was very close to giving birth. We were told there had been similar cases before, but the women had always killed themselves. You're a refugee? Yes. Where have you come from? I came from Kabul last Wednesday because the, there was a lot of... <laughs> life is dangerous in Afghanistan. I have to escape from Afghanistan, our, our lovely country, to go to the Pakistan, with, to join with our brother and Muslim brother and help, get help from the Pakistan. What made you what made you leave Kabul now at this time? Yeah, at this time I'm an engineer. Sometimes they force it on me to come join with us, otherwise we will put you to the jail. You mean to work for the government? Yes. And my daughters, I have two daughters, one of them studying in the faculty of law in the third in the fifth semester, and the other is in the faculty of medicine, and they force it on them to come join with us, but we are Muslim, we don't like the Russian government, and they always attack on all of us. And just we leave this country to go until we are in Pakistan to our no, friends, see. our brothers, all the Communist Party attacked on me, and always trying to uh, put me in the jail, this is my uncle son. They put them for two years in the jail, Policharchi, he was... You were in jail? Yeah, yeah. yeah. because he has to help with the Afghan people, Muslim, not working with the Russian government. They caught him and put in the jail, Policharchi, for two years. After two years, he come back. Now, if he is stay in Kabul, they put it again to the police uh, and maybe kill it. Maybe he, kill him? Yeah, he... Oh. What exactly were they trying to make you do? See, actually, the uh, Communist Party find our mind to what, what we have in our mind. Now they found we are not uh, with them. Just we want to our country free from Russia. And we don't want Russia to stay here to come to Afghanistan. Now they found us the same. They want to make a trick on us to put in the jail. After a few weeks, they will kill us. Later that day, we pushed on into the mountains. In the evening, we reached one of the group's main logistics bases that has been bombed several times by the Russians, but survived thanks to its natural defenses. The armory is tunneled into the side of the mountain and contains a whole array of weapons, all Russian or Chinese, heavy and light machine guns like this Goryunov, which fires 650 rounds a minute.
Chinese-made RPG-7 rocket launchers, a devastating anti-tank weapon at close range, and now in apparently plentiful supply with Mujahideen groups throughout the country. Such is the penetrating power of the nose cone that it can pierce armor plating and is deadly against soft-skinned vehicles. Hundreds of boxes of ammunition for the Zagoyak heavy machine gun. 82 millimeter recoilless rifle ammunition. And the weapon itself, Chinese made and extremely effective. Allahu Akbar. Next day, we met three young Russian defectors. Sergei Busov is 20 and comes from Perm, east of Moscow. He trained as an armored personnel carrier driver and was posted to Bagram Air Base near Kabul. He says he deserted from the army because he was constantly beaten up, once by an officer and regularly by NCOs. This, he says, is a tradition in the Soviet army, but he deserted when he couldn't endure it any longer. Like the others, he's become a Muslim. Possibly there was little choice, but he and the others seem to be completely accepted by the Mujahideen. Vladislav Naumov is 21 and comes from Volgograd, the old Stalingrad. He trained as a tank mechanic and a paratrooper and was posted to an army base near Jalalabad. He says he defected because when he and some other soldiers protested about bad food, he was arrested and imprisoned by the KGB. He managed to escape and made contact with the Mujahideen. Naumov says all of them were opposed to the Soviet system at home, where there was no freedom of the press, no freedom of speech, no political freedom. Although they're all European Russians, they seem very much at home in their new surroundings. <laughs> Naumov is writing a book about the war which will describe, he says, the behavior of the Soviet army in Afghanistan and the atrocities. How, for example, at the end of May 1983, a totally innocent Afghan, in his words, was held in front of a tank gun and blown to pieces. They defected separately, Naumov says, basically because they all opposed the war in Afghanistan on moral grounds. They met later and have been together for almost a year. The youngest of the three, Vadim Plotnikov on the left, is 19. He defected after only one week in the army in Afghanistan. I talked to them through an Afghan interpreter, Hello. and then Naumov gave their views on the war in Good Russian. Day. Good day. How are you? First of all, what I want to tell you is about the people who are doing bombardments in Afghanistan. This is the first time I have been in Afghanistan. Советское правительство прекрасно понимает то, что, в общем, когда делается, в общем, бомбардировка деревень или афганских городов, то э, при этих бомбардировках погибает очень много мирного населения афганского, которое не воюет против советской армии. Я лично э, готовился в городе Термази Узбекской СССР, в общем. Сначала я проходил десантно, э, что, ну, подготовку десантно-штурмовых батальонов. Вот, э, нас учили уничтожать э, кишлаки афганские. Э, такой же был, так, был придуман такой афга... э, маленький Афганистан на территории Узбекистана, где в общем, э, советские строители... Э, по-моему, даже под руководством афганских коммунистов, в общем, выстраивали большие кишлаки, вот, типа таких, которые, в общем, есть в Афганистане. И вот на этих кишлаках мы учились воевать в Афганистане. 
С какими трудностями здесь сталкивается в Афганистане советский солдат? Но это первое, конечно, что я не буду говорить о бытовых условиях. Конечно, здесь бытовые условия очень трудны, очень ужасны. Во-первых, рельеф этой страны не соответствует с рельефом нашей страны. Вот. И здесь по подготовке воевать очень трудно. Вот. Афганцы же, конечно, они знают, за что борются. В общем, борются они за свободу своей страны. А советские солдаты, что им, в общем, в Афганистане... Они не знают, зачем они пришли. Толком никто не знает, зачем они пришли в Афганистан и что им здесь нужно делать. Вот поэтому они к военным действиям относятся прохладно. Почему прохладно относятся еще к военным действиям? Потому что они боятся в общем, смерти. Каждый солдат хочет вернуться э, домой. В общем, его дома ждет или же семья, или его родственники. Вот. Поэтому, в общем, советские солдаты э, очень э, плохо здесь ведут боевые действия. Вот. Также э, советское командование очень, по-моему, очень недовольно э, ведением войны в Афганистане. Э, как, вернее, ведут э, войну в Афганистане советские солдаты. Wednesday, August the 1st. Hussein Pacha, the local commander, starts mustering his men for an ambush on the Kabul road, calling the roll and distributing ammunition. Altogether, about 200 men had been called up, a big group by local standards, but only 120 or so would take part in the operation. The rest would be in support, making sure the main force received supplies of food and ammunition. First, each man received a handout of 9mm ammunition for his Kalashnikov rifle. Many Mujahideen groups have been penetrated by the HUD, the local equivalent of the KGB, and so each Mujahid now carries an identity card with his photograph. One of the problems the Mujahideen face is finding men skilled enough to be SAM operators. Few Mujahideen have any military training, although they all have a natural aptitude for arms, and few have much formal education. Our group took in six SAM 7s, representing an investment of one and a half million dollars. This is the SAM 7B, the latest version, heat-seeking missile designed to lock on to an aircraft's exhaust. It has a range of three miles and a speed of 1,250 miles an hour. Chinese pressure mines made of plastic, so they're hard to detect. By removing the detonator in blue so that they no longer act as pressure mines, packing them with extra explosive and then wiring them up in batches, the Mujahideen hoped to pull off a spectacular ambush. There were generous supplies of C3 blasting gelignite, which is remarkably stable to handle. 
looks and smells like marzipan and can give you a nasty headache if you inhale the fumes for too long. Pound for pound, it's probably the most powerful explosive in everyday use. The plan here was to set off the mines in batches of 16 by remote control. It was an ambitious plan, perhaps too ambitious, and meant that each batch had to be wired together and then wired separately to a remote control exploder. I found myself reflecting, as on my trip two years ago, that although they may lack conventional military skills, the Afghans have a lot of ingenuity and are remarkably good at improvising. Well, the ambush site has finally been chosen, and this group of mine layers is setting off now to plant 80 mines on the main road, which is just over that hill, down at the bottom of a steep gorge. It's the main road from Kabul, the capital, to the important provincial city of Jalalabad, and along it run big Russian convoys regularly, uh, up to 250 or 300 vehicles, some of them carrying ammunition, petrol, and troops. Now today, a big convoy went along that road, but the guerrillas weren't ready. So they're hoping there'll be another convoy tomorrow or the next day. A group of young boys carries the last of the mines up the hillside. The rest of the force camps out at the foot of the mountain and prays for victory in the coming battle. Buoyed up by the belief that a place in heaven awaits the martyrs of the jihad. I wrote in my diary, their spirits seem very high, no sign of nerves. They despise the Russians as soldiers. The only thing they fear is their air power. Dawn, Friday, August the 3rd. In the middle of the picture, a Russian post guards the road to Kabul with tanks and a garrison. Well, the ambush plans seem to have gone wrong. We think the Russians know we're here and that the road is mined, because last night, apparently, the guerrillas made a lot of noise planting the mines, and the Russians opened fire, although haphazardly, the guerrillas say. What we do know is that the Russians have now blocked all civilian traffic on the road in both directions, and we're now waiting to see what happens next. What happened next was that the Russians started to mortar the mountaintop where we were. Well, the Russians have got us pinned down on the side of the mountain at the moment, and they're lobbing mortars. That's one just gone off on the top, just over the top here. And down below us on the road, there are five Russian tanks. We can't see them because the gorge is very steep. They're shooting back up at the Mujahideen positions with uh, tank guns, the main gun, and also with machine guns. And the Mujahideen are shooting back at them with RPG-7s, rocket, propelled grenades, and machine guns and we're waiting to see whether the Russians are going to put in an airstrike. It came at noon, 
two Mi-24 helicopter gunships armed with rockets and cannon, flying too high for the sands. When the first gunship opened fire, the rockets went right over our heads. Then the second gunship lined up and fired. The rockets smashing into the hillside above us. So the element of surprise having been lost and the ambush obviously not going to take place now, the guerrilla commander has ordered his troops who've been down there in the gorge all day to pull out tonight. It just shows you today's action how easy it is for the Russians to keep a grip on this road. They've got strong posts all along it about two miles apart from which they can rake the mountainside with heavy mortars and tank fire. But it also shows just how easy it is for the guerrillas, the Mujahideen, to cut the road at any time. Today they've stopped all traffic for the whole day and we don't know when it's going to start again. It shows you that they are in a very strong position to cut the road whenever they want to. And today, in fact, they have knocked out two tanks. But the hard fact is that, that due to lack of professionalism, what might have been a famous victory for the Mujahideen ended as just another skirmish. Surprisingly, casualties were very light, only two wounded. Looking after wounded Mujahideen is one of the things the Russian defectors do voluntarily. They have some first aid training. In Naumov's case, it runs in the family. His mother was a doctor, his brother is a dentist. This man was wounded by pieces of shrapnel from a mortar. The Mujahideen have almost nothing in the way of medical supplies. A serious wound usually means gangrene and death. By showing they care, the Russians are no doubt making their own act of atonement for the behavior of their fellow countrymen. But for Naumov especially, their defection to the Mujahideen is much more than a personal protest. листовки на русском языке вот. значит записывали мы на кассету специально для советских людей живущих в советском союзе значит программу делали вот. рассказывали правду о афганистане и много другой работы в общем написали там письмо черненко и Сделали, в общем, выполнили много работы в Афганистане. Можно привести э, очень много примеров о жестокостях, творящихся в Афганистане, о том, как советские солдаты, порой э, накурившись наркотиков, идут в бой и не осознавая того, что они делают, в общем, Творят они невероятно ужасно в Афганистане. Но э, практически э, за наркотиками 
за употреблением наркотиков в Афганистане. В общем, никто из руководства, из военного руководства не следит, потому что это играет в какой-то степени на руку советскому правительству, советской политике. This village was bombed by the Russians last winter. Two people were killed. The remaining 11 families fled as refugees, except for one man, Ghul Mahmud. His family are all now in Pakistan, but he came back alone to work the land and to help the Mujahideen. Just below the village were two unexploded Russian bombs. Plotnikov, who comes from Moscow, was trained as an engineer in bomb disposal, and he offered to help get rid of them. A lump of gelignite is shaped and placed against the casing of the 500-pounder. The detonator is pushed home into the gelignite and the fuse wire attached. Plotnikov lights it and runs. He has a minute to get clear. <laughs> Very good. You might want to say something. You might want to say something. You might want to say Thursday, August the 9th. Great excitement in camp at the news that the leader of the group, Yunis Halis himself, was approaching. Red-bearded and sprightly for a man of 67, Yunis Halis is the only senior resistance leader with headquarters in Pakistan who crosses regularly into Afghanistan to visit his men in the field. He recently married a young wife and had a son, which his followers see as a commendable sign of his virility. He says it's the duty of every Afghan to refuse to submit to oppression. Yunis Khalis is not a soldier, but a mullah, a man of God, deeply versed in the teaching of the Prophet and in the words of the Quran. The struggle between good and evil is still going on, he says, and is symbolized by today's war against the Russians. Now, you're getting a lot more arms than when I was here two years ago, but is it enough? <laughs> In the past few weeks, we've been traveling through virtually depopulated country. Isn't this a sign of victory for the Russians? The Russians are not
مگر دا د مجاهدینو په ګټه هم ده زکا منګ تا د افغانستان د مسلمانانو روحیه معلومه ده چې هغوی د زور او د شکنجې په مقابل کې لا را پاریږي او لا د هغه مقابل کې قوت پیدا کوي دغه وجه ده چې موږ په سب کې کوم شهید پیدا کېږي زمونږ هغه سب په د دې په ځای چې مرچل کې تیګو ته ولوېږي په ولاړه باندې جنګ کوي او هغه په دښمن باندې حمله کوي نو موږ یقین کوو چې دو دغه وضع دا دوی لپاره په خیر نه بلکې دوی لپاره په ضرر تمام دي الله اکبر Next day we went to inspect a nearby government fort which the Mujahideen were besieging. The first rounds fell short. Then they got the range. بس Two to three hundred Afghan soldiers garrison the fort at Hisarak, which can only be resupplied by air or by heavily armed convoy. بس The Mujahideen brought up a recoilless rifle. At the suggestion of the Mujahideen, the Russians fired a Goryunov light machine gun at a corner of the fort. In the afternoon, the helicopter gunships arrived to pound the Mujahideen positions first dropping flares to decoy any SAMs, and then firing rockets. is switched on, the battery has a life of only 60 seconds, in which time the operator must get lock on to the target, otherwise he cannot fire. He does fire, but without lock on, nothing happens. An Mi-24, heavily armor plated, but still cautious enough to drop decoy flares. The second SAM is made ready. But again, possibly because the gunship stayed so high as to be out of range, he did not get lock on. That just goes to show how very difficult it is to use this weapon, the SA-7. Even the Russian makers claim a success ratio of one in four. That's under ideal conditions. But in combat conditions such as these, the real kill ratio is probably much more like one in 10. A few days later, the Russians resupplied the fort by air. 
On their way back, an MI-8 flew right past us very low. The Mujahideen took position with one RPG and one SAM. The RPG fired first. You can just hear it. But missed. Then the SAM lined up on the first MI-24. But without success. This shows you once more just how difficult it is to use the SA-7 against Russian helicopters. In this case, the Mujahid fired at a helicopter which was flying at about 500 feet. It should have been an easy target. In effect, the SAM misfired. The seeker here uh, did leave the tube, but the missile didn't. So, although he might well have thought that he had an easy target and a certain kill, he failed. Or rather, the SAM failed. Indeed, Western experts rate the SAM as a poor weapon by today's standards. The last time we met the Russians, they talked about the future. I, I want to go in America. And you've got an uncle there? Yes. New York, Washington. Stay in New York? Yes, New York, very good. I want to go to America to start working здесь в Афганистане. Первая задача, которая будет у нас здесь в Афганистане, предотвратить войну между Советским Союзом значит, и афганскими партизанами. Конечно, мы хотим, чтобы война окончилась в пользу, в пользу афганских партизан. И для этого мы будем прикладывать в общем, все усилия в Афганистане для нашей будущей значит, совместной работы. Конечно, победа афганского народа будет, значит, победа и русского народа. Значит, афганский, если афганский народ победит, значит, победит и русский народ. Значит, прекратится кровопролитие, значит, прекратятся смерти советских солдат и афганского народа. Brave and civilized words by Vladislav Naumov end the war and stop the bloodshed. But there's no sign that the Russians have any thought of withdrawing from Afghanistan. In fact, just the opposite. They're intensifying the war, trying to block the arms routes and bombing the population into the refugee camps. As I watched Juma Khan, wounded by a mortar in the unsuccessful siege of the fort at Hisarak, preparing for the long trek out over the mountains to Pakistan, I came to two conclusions. First, that Afghan courage and morale are still enormously high. But second, unless they can find an answer to the Russians' helicopter gunships, and the SAM isn't one, their morale may begin to crack eventually. Five years is a long time for a small nation of 16 million to fight a superpower of 273 million. The Mujahideen can be criticized for being undisciplined tribesmen. They say, who else could have fought the Russians virtually single-handed for five years and still be fighting? In the end, the fate of the Mujahideen will be decided by how much more aid they get from Pakistan, China and the West, and whether that will include a more effective anti-aircraft missile. That means a Western missile, and at the moment, Pakistan is too afraid of the Russians to let them through. So what will the next five years bring? The war will almost certainly go grinding on because the Afghans don't give up easily. It will mean more of this. No one knows the toll among the Afghans. There are no statistics. But the number of dead and wounded must run in to scores of thousands, many of them children.
These are the lucky ones. They reached Pakistan and hospital. They at least have some sort of future. For many others inside Afghanistan, there may be no future. Mm-hmm.